Uh, good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you to the uh, 2013 Phoenix Center Telecom Symposium Economist Panel. The Economist Panel is an annual tradition. Phoenix Center provides a forum for noted telecommunication economists of various vintages, I might point out, to present an economic interpretation of current telecommunications policy issues in an accessible, insightful way. The theme of uh, the entire conference is challenges for the incoming FCC, and certainly among those challenges uh, for the new administration uh, will be issues dealing with spectrum. And our economist panels are certainly going to touch upon on this issue from uh, several perspectives. I need to point out that each panelist has selected their own presentation that represents their own point of view. And it's necessary to point out as well that the views expressed do not necessarily represent the views of the Phoenix Center, the employers of the panelists, or possible sponsors or staff of the panelist employer organization. This morning, we're very pleased to have with us on the panel three uh, very well-known uh, telecommunications, telecommunications economists. Uh, first, Dr. Richard Clark, who is uh, Assistant Vice President for Economic and Regulatory Policy at AT&T, and they will make their presentations in the order of introducing them. Second, we have Dr. Thomas Hazlett, who is currently a professor of law and economics at the George Mason University School of Law. And finally, uh, Dr. George Ford, who is chief economist here at the Phoenix Center. At the conclusion of uh, the presentation, the panelists will have the opportunity to um, ask each other a few questions or comments, and then we'll try to have a, a few minutes for some questions uh, from the audience. So, without further ado, Rich, if you want to jump in. talk to you a little bit about uh, my modeling of how much spectrum is needed for U.S. mobile wireless carriers in order to satisfy the demand as it's growing and growing over the next decade. And a lot of people have opined about spectrum needs recently, with some people arguing that U.S. mobile carriers can easily satisfy rising demand without substantially more licensed spectrum allocations and rather they if they simply would just implement known technological improvements or increase their sharing of spectrum with government or unlicensed Wi-Fi users or deploy a lot more cell sites that that would solve all of the problems. Uh, I've done the modeling that I've done which I'm going to show to you kind of tries to take away shows that you have to take away this punch bowl and reports on how much license spectrum you are going to have to have even if you to the maximum reasonable extent do all of those other three things of implementing technological improvements, increasing uh, sharing or offload, as well as deploying more wireless cell sites. Okay, so we're first going to start out with talking about what the challenge that we're facing is, and then just what are the different methods we have available to expand wireless capacity. Look a little bit about how effective they've been over the last 30 years, as well as try to estimate how effective they may be in the upcoming uh, decade. And the conclusion you're going to see is without a lot more raw spectrum, even using all of these methods together and intensively, we're not going to be able to keep up with forecasted uh, demand growth. And unfortunately, in the alternative, if we're not going to do this, well, the market has its way of dealing with this type of issue. And the general way the market deals with these issues is to uh, have uh, upwards price pressure if there's not adequate supply growth to match demand growth. And as Jerry said, and I appreciate it, that these are my views 
and not those necessarily in AT&T. And the modeling that I'm doing is kind of nationally of the US as a national average profile. It does not assume that it's not specific to any particular carrier and may not be applicable in any particular sub-geography of the US. It's just kind of national average modeling. So what does everybody start out with? They start out with the, the, the scare slides about how demand growth is, is exploding. And this is, this is the one that Erickson puts out that generally shows that until the uh, mid-2000s, uh, voice was the most important application. And since that time, voice has remained very stable, and it's data that has increased greatly. Note also that this is an estimate of growth in demand for mobile wireless. It is not including growth in demand for data services that are generated by mobile wireless devices that happen to be connected to fixed networks through Wi-Fi or mechanisms of that sort. That is a separate measurement, and that is a huge and growing usage of mobile devices, but this is looking at the demand for mobile devices for truly mobile data services. Cisco has also a very famous estimate called the Visual Networking Index, and indeed that's the one that I use to forecast demand growth. It currently forecasts demand growth out to about 2017, and I continue a projection of what Cisco projects, assuming that demand growth begins to de decay after that point, and by 2022 is just no higher than what current fixed demand, fixed line demand, uh, wire uh, data demand growth is. But note that this estimate, you know, may look scary, but it's more conservative than what Ericsson is estimating, and a lot more conservative than what Qualcomm has estimated for demand growth over this period. So what are the tools that we have to address this exploding demand? Well, the one that everybody knows is let's just get more spectrum out there. If you've got more radio spectrum in your network, you have increased capacity. Unfortunately, though, the spectrum bands that are usable for mobile wireless are very scarce. A lot of it is currently being used either for broadcast television or for government use. And thus far, these entities have had little economic incentive to relinqu relinquish it, even if there's a higher valued mobile use. Uh, the FCC is currently engaged, as you probably all know, in trying to devise a set of incentive auctions to take spectrum and reallocate it from the broadcasters and into mobile wireless. It's a very complex initiative. We certainly hope it works, uh, but it's going to be nip and tuck for the next several years in order to figure out how effective this will be at pushing spectrum over to mobile wireless from uh, TV broadcast. In addition, there are initiatives underway to try to increase the amount of uh, spectrum that's currently in government use for commercial mobile wireless use. And you know, the book the, the, it hasn't been written yet how effective that's going to be. But I'm sure a lot of the, the people on the subsequent spectrum policy panels will, uh, will talk a great deal about this. So if you look at the graph there, you see the amounts of spectrum that have generally been used in the different wire, mobile wireless technologies over the past uh, 30 years. And uh, the key to note is that spectrum has grown, allocated spectrum from roughly 0 megahertz back in the early 80s to you know, effectively now, this goes out to 1912, 2012, about 380 megahertz being used then. Uh, however, demand has grown by far greater than that over this period of time. So that's one part of the, uh, of the of clue to uh, one piece of the puzzle for satisfying increasing demand. The next one is to try to get more data bytes transferred over every megahertz of spectrum that you have deployed. And the good news here is that newer mobile wireless technologies can carry more bits per second per hertz. 
And as you migrate customers towards these new technologies, that means more traffic can be handled within a given amount of spectrum. Uh, if you look at the graph on the left, you see relatively what the spectral efficiency is of the 1G, 2G, 3G, and up to 4G and, 4, and advanced 4G technologies. Uh, so you can get very significant increases in throughput. And if you look at if weighting the spectrum allocations over the past uh, 30 years by the effective throughput capability of each uh, spectrum allocation, you can see you know, how much, uh, how, for example, how little data 2G currently carries, how much 3G carries, and how much 4G, even though it's using very little spectrum right now, is carrying. But remember, a key to this is it's not just putting in the new technology. It's moving customers over to that technology. And unfortunately, we often see both commercial and regulatory barriers to retiring old wireless technologies and moving to new ones. Uh, so it's going to be essential that we aggressively move people off of the old 2G technologies and onto 3G and 4G. Finally, the method that everybody's most familiar with is by increasing reuse of spectrum. If you deploy more towers and more cells, splitting cells, you can reuse a given enough megahertz in a particular area and increase the capacity that you provide in that area. And if you look at the number of cell sites deployed in the U.S. over the past, again, 30 years, it's gone from practically nothing to a number that's over 300,000 right now. Uh, while this method is extremely effective, unfortunately, it's also rather expensive. And it also, the cost tends to scale no better than linearly. Because every new tower you have to put up, you need to acquire real estate, you need to put in backhaul. And you start off with the most cheapest, best areas to put towers in, and the increasing more, more newer ones generally tend to be more expensive and may carry less data, just because they you took the good sites to begin early, early in the process, and only the, worse or, uh, the, the less effective sites are available now. So what's the relative contributions of this? Uh, if you look at this over the past 30 years, you can see, well, that the red line shows the spectral capacity improvement by just uh, increasing the amount of spectrum and moving towards higher uh, more efficient, uh, newer technologies of, uh, of mobile wireless has allowed the increase since the, you know, 1985 of roughly a hundredfold in the carrying capacity of networks. By increasing the number of cell sites of this same variant, you have that blue reuse index, and that that's uh, it's a logarithmic scale. It's probably increased it about 300 or so times. And if you multiply those two together, you come up with what the total capacity improvement is, which is the green line, which you know, over the period of this period, we now have capacity that's, uh, I think it's around 200,000 times what we had in 1985. And if you look at the traffic index, yes, it's been able to stay ahead of what's happened to traffic demand over that period of time. But that was then. We're now looking in the future. Will these tools continue to be adequate over the next decade? Well, one, everybody knows we're aggressively putting in 4G LTE and LTE advanced. And these techniques, these uh, technologies can offer substantial improvements. And I'm not going to go through the specific technical details of them. But in a general, what you find is that 4G LTE is roughly 45% more spectrally efficient than 3G technologies, and about 135%, if what, they'll be 135% more efficient when we go to a newer technology called LTE Advanced, which is beginning to be deployed and probably really won't come into its own for another two or three years. And the reasons for this is that not only do they offer substantial direct throughputs, but they can also support more efficient deployment of what we call heterogeneous networks, which are comprised of a lot of small cells, makes them more economic. Uh, it also reduces latency, allows us to retire separate voice networks and improve network packing. The, the 
less uh, empty space within your within your spectrum. But it all comes with a uh, you know because it's so because these technologies are so good they create even more demand for themselves because they have greater speed and functionality so therefore more applications can effectively use use be used over these networks which just encourages future usage growth. Sad, but it's a wonderful problem to have. So if you estimate how much we're going to have in the future, well, according to the National Broadband Plan, we're going to have 300 more megahertz of spectrum by 2015. So far, they've gotten a little less than about, about a quarter of the way there uh, over the last four years, three years. So I'm not sure we're going to quite get to the 300 by 2015. Uh, but if we do, you would see improvement in the amount of spectrum we would have being that dotted blue line. If we don't get the 300 megahertz, it's going to just be the solid blue line of improvement in uh, the amount of spectrum. If we look at an aggressive migration to uh, higher G technologies, we'll get e the, the, the two red lines, the, red, the higher red line, the dotted one, assumes again that you have 300 megahertz more spectrum and assume that that will all be deployed as LTE advanced. Uh, the green line assumes increased reuse and it assumes that because of the greater capability of LTE advanced to handle heterogeneous networks and small cells, that we have an effective doubling in cell site growth from what the historic growth has been over the last six years uh, going on into the future. Instead of growing at about 8% a year, it is seems to going to grow about 16% a year in terms of cell sites, which is a very aggressive assumption. And there's some network packing there. So what happens when you combine all of these components uh, that allow you to increase uh, network capacity? Well, you get that red line there. And the red line either is the solid red line, if we just have fill up the current spectrum we have, and all that 194 megahertz of clear wire EBS uh, BRS spectrum does get used just as much as cellular or PCS spectrum gets used, uh, you have the red line. If you get 300 megahertz more, you get the dotted red line. But unfortunately, the demand index is the blue line. And it very quickly exceeds both of the two red lines. And indeed, if you are going to keep, if you're going to move the capacity index up to match the demand index through 2022, you're going to have to add not 300 megahertz of spectrum, you're going to have to add about 560 megahertz of spectrum just to keep pace, assuming everything else goes swimmingly too. So in summary, you know, mobile wireless technologies have become more capable. They've got faster speeds, lower latency, greatly improved data capacity. But demand's been growing even faster. And meeting this challenge is going to require more capable technologies, more intensive spectrum reuse, but also a lot more raw spectrum, about 560 megahertz. And this is necessary in order to avoid uh, a change in the price trajectory from what it's been to one of higher prices in order to, which might have the effect of possibly of suppressing otherwise desirable demand growth. I look forward to the discussion. spent all my uh, time preparing slides on Rich's presentation <laughs> and uh, they really came out nicely Rich. Uh, no, those were great uh, great slides and they they do describe um, obviously a challenge we all face. Before I get to that I, I want to uh, I want to start out with this. I got this memo that we have to start with this. We need to change the culture here in Washington. <laughs> I got the memo that that's all that you have to start your talk in Washington. Um, so, uh, but the spectrum allocation, 
uh, it does march to its own pace. And it's something that uh, you know everybody talks about. And uh, people purport to do something about. But uh, it's great uh, not being an academic and not being uh, not being an academic. It's, it's it's good being an academic and not being responsible for outcomes. Maybe that sometimes you get to sit back and, and uh, try to gauge what that pace is, and then you know how that that pace may may go differently. And now we're watching the. Um, a very serious effort in 2009-2010 National Broadband Plan report that Rich referred to, which did take a good hard look at what's happening in broadband and really uh, reached the conclusion that the number one thing that regulators could do to help U.S. broadband development would be to uh, allow more license spectrum, liberal license spectrum, to get into the marketplace and be used uh, more productively by, by carriers building these advanced networks. And uh, I was uh, fairly thrilled by that emphasis. And um, I try to maintain my enthusiasm. But the, uh, the new analytical question is not what, what needs to be done, but how to do it. And watching the incentive auction process, we see that uh, there are really uh, very important trade-offs between um, alternative approaches and the, um, the selection of the FCC was to go through a very regulatory intensive process. The FCC is market maker and uh, running a two-sided auction. Um, and um, I will say that I uh, was pleased to see in my email inbox this morning um, that the comparison of the FCC's incentive auction uh, rule processing has been compared to the Obamacare website by the FCC itself. <laughs> so none of us have to have to go there first. Um, it is a very complex process and at various points, the commission has actually boasted of that. And I think they're kind of on the wrong track when they put forward the complexity of a policy as something that we should be impressed by. Obviously, we should be impressed by the results of the policy. And uh, in 2009, we embarked on this um, path that led us to a 2010 report saying we did need to move 300 megahertz of spectrum into the marketplace for the carriers and others to bid on and to use however the market wanted to deploy it. And um, the report was careful to say that we take too long in these allocations, 6 to 13 years being the estimated time, uh, generous underestimate in my opinion, but 6 to 13 years being the estimate given, uh, which was all too long, said the report, delays cost society billions and billions, but here we are in 2013 hoping that uh, there is uh, some kind of a process uh, at the end of this road that does reallocate spectrum from over-the-air broadcasting to uh, uh, mobile wireless, other advanced technologies, and we're hoping that that's 2015, maybe the spectrum gets turned around 2016. So we're already in the 6 to 13 year period. And that's what we're trying to beat the 6 to 13 year lag. And uh, so we really have to take seriously the format, the allocational format that involves so much delay um, and transaction costs within the political sphere and the public sector, obviously with many private parties playing in the game. And um, we have to recognize when we're getting ourselves into a land war in Asia. Now, I use that reference, with all due respect to you young people in the audience, knowing that my students give me a blank stare when I say land war in Asia. Um, 
unless they watch Animal House, they have no idea what being eligible for military service uh, used to mean to college students. But at any rate, um, getting bogged down in some kind of a process that seems to have no end in sight um, is uh, really a place we want to avoid. And we want to use good policy to get around that. Now, the incentive auction structure um, is, at a theoretical level, a very large advance uh, over some of the techniques that we've tried to employ in the past. And it really does try to get market revelation about demand and, and cost conditions. That's the whole point of, of the auction structure. And um, certainly thinking in these terms is, uh, is, is to be applauded, but we need to be very careful about the sorts of uh, cul-de-sacs we, we, we go down when we're trying to actually turn spectrum around into more productive use because it's so easy to get sidetracked. And uh, just to give you an example that touches on, uh, if not being central to the auction, uh, the incentive auction process, there's a little bit of a debate now about uh, over-the-air television and how valuable it might be to society and how important it might be for the government to continue its um, that policy started in 1939 of locking in large bandwidth to over-the-air broadcasting. Um, you know, if we just go a little while longer, we will make it to 100 years with that one policy of being rigidly picked in place and enforced. Uh, well, it's not that far, 2039. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the idea now, however, is that, uh, well, we, got, we might have gotten to 93% or whatever it was, penetration for cable and satellite, but now people are dropping cable and satellite, uh, particularly 20-somethings. And, uh, you know, the, the market penetration of cable and satellite is being reduced. And so, therefore, uh, over-the-air television is coming back into vogue. Now, First of all, that has nothing to do with the market value of over-the-air broadcast television spectrum, as allocated by the FCC. The, the question for broadcasters uh, is, what's the most efficient way to distribute the, the product that they have? And there's no question in any kind of a real examination of the issue that um, cable and satellite uh, have tremendous efficiency properties. And um, for that reason, have been adopted by 90% plus of U.S. households. Um, the um, rest of the United States certainly could be supplied cable and static, uh, excuse me, broadcast television programming without any uh, significant marginal cost compared to the marginal cost, or the, excuse me, the marginal value that would be released by taking the entire TV spectrum out for more valuable services. But the, uh, the funny thing about the debate is, to the extent that there is some slippage in cable and satellite, it's because of the next generation of delivery technology, uh, broadband internet. So we're now two generations beyond the 1939 world where over-the-air terrestrial broadcasting made a lot of sense. Uh, and yet we get confused about debates about who needs broadcasting and how popular it is and where the allocation should be. Well, there should be some, some real efficiency uh, introduced to the system through allowing market pricing and letting the, the spectrum go to where uh, it does the most good. Now, as Rich's slides show, we're, we're kind of in a fix now. And the mess, I'm happy to say, the mess is caused by liberalization. Okay, we wouldn't be having this kind of a discussion today if there hadn't been, over the last 30 years, some very important decisions made about mobile telephony that were strikingly different than decisions, regulatory decisions, made about broadcast radio and television. So the new liberal licensing model that's come out of the uh, mobile uh, or cellular world, that really accounts for this tremendous economic activity uh, in these networks that have developed, the advanced wireless networks. And you're just seeing just enormous social value being uh, created on, on, on so many different levels. And you know, there are entire, entire conferences today, uh, little spin-offs like M Health, that have come out of this very liberal environment where markets really do allocate spectrum to its highest value use. And business models can come and go, be tested in the market, 
lots of experimentation. Uh, there is no government approval process for the iPhone. And you think, well, why should there be? Well, because for 70 years there has been an approval process for TV sets. And standards have been set in Washington. And that's why that's a different world. And the great uh, unleashing of value you're seeing, some characterize it as a mobile data tsunami, uh, really is a testimony to how successful the liberalization has been. And there is this voracious appetite that has been uh, sort of uh, teased, tantalized, fed just slightly uh, for more wireless. And if we can really take a hard look at our allocation institutions, the radio spectrum, and, and see what's working, and there are a lot of things that have, and could be working even better, I think we can uh, make real progress. But it remains to be seen, because there is certainly a lot of institutional inertia, and um, even when we start to go down the right path, it's very easy to get caught up in the administrative quagmires uh, that uh, certainly come out of many of these uh, economic decisions. So with that, I'll just say that there really are alternatives uh, one of the costs of the incentive auction, which you know we, I think we all hope, uh, does well, moves forward, and, and does release significant amounts of broadcast TV spectrum uh, to be bid in their highest value of use. But one of the costs of that system is that there really it, it has sucked the oxygen out of all other approaches to spectrum allocation, um, and and there there ought to be real attention paid, and there ought to be real evaluation paid of how the, the current incentive auction process is working and alternatives that might, might do better. And um, I, will, I will just quickly say I've written a bit on this and people are tired. Uh, those who have heard me, heard, uh, you know, it's uh, like a student at the University of Chicago who fell asleep in Milton Friedman's class and Professor Friedman uh, threw an eraser at him and hit him on the head and he woke up with a start looked at the professor and said, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Professor Friedman, I admit I fell asleep, but the answer is reduce the money supply. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just woke up with a start, uh, I'll say the answer is overlays. And um, th there are very powerful ways to download a lot of the complexity of spectrum reallocation uh, to parties that are better equipped to handle it than administrators at a regulatory institution. And overlays that uh, are issued, we have experience with them. This is a regulatory success story in PCS, in AWS, and some other uh, allocations or reallocations of spectrum, where you allow secondary rights to be created and sold in the market that have to respect the incumbents in a, in a market. The licensee now has the incentive to investigate, create, and then implement reallocation dealing with the incumbents in the band. And the incumbents can be public or private. And so one of the things that I think is a bright sign is that some of the regulators themselves, uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel has recently been talking about uh, honey licenses being auctioned for certain blocks of public spectrum where firms would be allowed to bid again, to have secondary rights to a particular band, and then once owning that license, they would have the ability to internalize gains from implementing spectrum sharing solutions, which in many cases will involve buying out government operations, creating new radio solutions for those agencies, uh, and economizing on spectrum all in one um, competitive market bundle. So those overlays have been implemented by governments in the United States and elsewhere, and they have done very well in reallocations, and I hope that we uh, continue to think about how those overlays might be used in the TV ban, um, uh, to the extent that the, the incentive auctions don't intend to reallocate all TV spectrum. There's still going to be a TV ban uh, inventory of stations that uh, are sitting on traditionally regulated spectrum that's rigidly locked into an old application 
and could benefit from overlays. But of course, there's a vast amount of other spectrum that is underutilized, inflexible, rigidly locked into some old allocation, and could be unleashed in value. The value could be unleashed there by allowing private parties to have these uh, these secondary rights and to uh, uh, to make the uh, the adjustments necessary. So. Um, I, I hope that uh, as we move forward here, we can get uh, a little more concerned about the um, actual evaluation of these alternative government processes, where the transaction costs really cut. Uh, there is no such thing as a free spectrum allocation. And unfortunately, in terms of putting forward uh, particular uh, policy paths, uh, regulators tend to um, uh, not only suffer from confirmation bias, when they look around the world they tend to see uh, evidence that's uh, supporting them and not see the evidence the other way, but uh, they certainly have political reasons to um, make very um, uh, one-sided statements about the uh, costs and benefits of the path they're proceeding. So there should be kickback on that. Academics should provide it and other institutions should provide it. And regulators to the extent that they're smart and they do want to take a leadership role, we'll actually pay attention to some of that uh, alternative thinking and some of that critical scrutiny that um, can uh, really evaluate how we're looking at uh, spectrum allocation, uh, which I'm glad to say is now moving to a front page issue because um, really these uh, you know, these slides are analytical in the sense of looking at, you know, capacity and so forth, but they really do, in the end, mean how much uh, value can be delivered to society, um, how much educational service, how much health service, how much um, social development, how much economic development uh, in developing countries. Uh, there really is a hugely important uh, opportunity that is uh, not fully being met. We've just seen the tip of the iceberg. And so I, uh, I hope that our improved understanding of uh, government processes, regulatory outcomes, and really the transaction costs of alternative uh, spectrum allocation uh, methods can be, uh, can be better understood as we move forward uh, to give us a better path. Spectrum. I was a graduate student and I was writing on cable television and I was sort of, uh, or Tom, I think, uh, made his first mark in uh, communications policy, read a lot of his work, introduced to him. It's a real honor to be here with him. He's certainly one of my mentors over time and certainly Jerry who was, who was my guru at the FCC. Where were you in graduate school? Um, Auburn. Auburn? Auburn War Eagle. <laughs> Well, tell them about the football game. That's what they want to know. Everybody <laughs> knows about the football game. <laughs> yeah, it's on broadcast TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I watched it on satellite, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, about a year ago, I got interested in, uh, in the government, uh, question of the government spectrum, largely because we were working on issues of allocating spectrum. We had the broadband plan and it's 300, 500 megahertz uh, standards or, or goals. And you begin to wonder where, where all that's going to come from. And the focus on the government was, uh, was pretty, pretty obvious uh, for a number of reasons. We just released a paper uh, that is the culmination of that effort, at least the initial uh, culmination of that effort. Uh, yesterday, our policy paper number 46. It's um, it's a slog getting through the paper, and I apologize for that. It's very dense. Um, there's a lot in there. The ideas actually are fairly simple, and I'll try to go through them today so you don't have to uh, get too bogged down in it. But I encourage you to read it. Uh, much of the material is supportive of what we're trying to argue. There are a lot of quotes and things like that. The points are fairly simple, although it is 
uh, pretty rich on uh, economic content, and I'll try to simplify that with some blogs and maybe a webinar going forward. Uh, the big spectrum topics today, the commercial sector needs more spectrum. Uh, and then you say, well, where is it going to come from? We just don't have piles of it laying around. Uh, we're going to have to take it out of people's hands. Uh, in some cases, probably out of your cold, dead hands, as I like to say. Uh, since Tommy's speaking to broadcasters, I think that's one instance. And then the question is, who's going to get it? As we've seen in incentive auctions, um, how do we uh, rig the game in order to favor particular entities, particular outcomes? And that's what we want to do. I gave a speech last week uh, at the uh, New America Foundation uh, event on the Hill and, and basically said that uh, we're, we may be at the end of the auction era in this uh, country. The FCC is taking a fancy to auction business plans rather than spectrum uh, lately and now we're uh, trying to implement policies with the administration through the DOJ and it's supported subsequently by uh, Tom Powell with the administration saying that the auction should be rigged uh, to choose particular winners, which is really a uh, prepared period dressed up as an auction. That's not to say that auctions don't have rules. Uh, they can have rules of general applicability, uh, but picking in winners and losers is a problem, and I think we'll face serious uh, legal challenge and legal risk. Um, so where is our spectrum going to come from? Charlotte says the government. Charlotte says it must be true, uh, but that's where we're going to look. Why are we looking there? Well, if you look at the PCAST report, federal agencies are assigned about half of the beach spectrum between 225 and 327 gigahertz. So they have a lot of it. Okay, so it's naturally we go looking there. It's not the only place, of course. We are looking at the broadcast industry um, as well. As I, I think my interest. Part of my interest in, in government spectrum came from the BCAS report, which I found shocking uh, when I read it, and, and more shocking the more I read it. Um, but there was some basic groundwork laid there that I want to cover because I think it's important. Uh, the first is that uh, federal users currently have no incentive to improve the efficiency with which they use their own spectrum allocation. Now, this is a government sponsored report saying this. Okay? Federal agencies have no incentive to efficiency. Uh, that's a pretty important point. Okay? And the reason it's important because if you're not using the economist, when somebody's not using something efficiently, what that means is you could do the same thing with less of it. And if you can do the same thing with less of it, then we can take that part, that less of it part, and then move it someplace else. Okay? To take it from the government and then put it in the commercial sector. But more importantly, I think, is the statement in the PCAST report that says the federal system as a whole, as a whole, does not have the incentives to improve efficiency. The federal system as a whole has no incentive to improve efficiency. That's a very potent statement and I think a legitimate one, although it does come from one source. There are supporting materials from other sources that we include in the paper. It's also true, according to the BCAS report, that we have a long history of failed attempts to implement significant reforms in federal spectrum use and management for that matter. Okay? So there's no incentive to efficiently use it, no incentive to efficiently manage it, and everything we try to change it has been a failure. Pretty significant points. That's the summary of what I just said. Now, so what is helpful in this regard? Well, the PGAS report concludes that requiring federal agencies to purchase spectrum rights through a market mechanism will go a long way towards achieving transparency, accountability, and efficiency. So moving to a market, a more market mechanism will improve efficiency. Okay? And there's other cases, the broadband plan and also in the PCAS report, that discusses how the market outcome is sort of the gold standard of efficiency. It is the target of efficiency for policy. That's why people talk about using market prices to, to fix various things. And the desire then, of course, is to move quickly to a market mechanism so that federal users will be efficient. 
Okay, so we have inefficient users, inefficient managers, ineffective reform, and the market mechanism is a solution. Now, this is seems to be a pretty obvious path, right? I mean, we're economists, we lay out assumptions, and sometimes it's pretty obvious where these assumptions will take us. Um, it's not true in this case. Uh, the, one of the first conclusions of the PCAST report was the traditional practice of clearing government spectrum and auctioning it is not sustainable. So it effectively calls for the end of the auction era, at least with respect to reclaiming the government spectrum and moving it to the private sector. So we have inefficient use, inefficient management, failed reform, market dissolution, let's throw out the market solution, the first market solution. Big S also throws out the second market solution, which is to price the spectrum to the government. And instead proposes to a radically different model with increased White House involvement that where the president tells all federal agencies to cooperate with a new spectrum organization called the Spectrum Management Team, a group including the White House Chief Technology officers, officer, as well as representatives from the National Security Staff, the Office of uh, Management and Budget, the National Economic Council, the SMT will coordinate policies with the NTIA and the FCC, an executive independent federal agency already tasked with spectrum policy, as well as take advice from a group of industry executives in a new advisory group called the Spectrum Sharing Partnership Steering Committee. The plan also requires the creation of a new database, the Spectrum Access System, which runs parallel to the federal management, spectrum management system, which is presently under redesign by a joint effort between the NTIA and the Department of Defense. Moreover, the report proposes the creation of a new, federal, uh, a new accounting allocation and incentive system that attempts to improve the efficiency with which federal agencies treat their spectrum. Not only are the details of such an incentive system yet to be worked out, but the incentive system requires Congress to write new legislation to amend the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act. In addition, an effort to avoid congestion will inevitably threaten, will threaten the common pool system they propose, the PCAF proposes uh, that uh, prioritization be offered in return for usage fees levied uh, in a newly and highly complex monitoring and pricing system. And then, of course, the proposal for sharing requires uh, new regulation for receiving performance. Now, you have inefficient use, inefficient management, they'll reform, markets are the solution, except this comes up, which was obvious enough to me uh, looking at the uh, outlay of, of the first set of uh, conditions um, that we had, that this was the obvious solution. The solution to an inefficient government with no incentive to use, efficiently use, no incentive to efficiently manage, and failed efforts in the past is a radically new system involving more government. That sounds right. I mean, the logical flow uh, is consistent. This is a a statement from the PCAST report, and I just couldn't help myself um, on this. Today's apparent shortage of spectrum is the result of assigning exclusive rights to use the spectrum frequency in a specific location into ever more finely divided exclusive frequency assignments. By using the technological innovations of recent years, we can transform the availability of the precious natural resource spectrum from scarcity to abundance. Now, when economists hear scarcity to abundance, it kind of makes us want to puke. <laughs> Mainly because we're in the business of studying scarcity. And scarcity is everywhere. It even makes Star Trek difficult to watch at times. But I kept thinking, I've heard this story before. I've heard this argument before. And so I began to look for it. And I will tell you, I do have a field in the history of economic thought. Taught by two of the best in the business in order. Here's the quote. The same will be true of agriculture, which also suffers from the pressure of private property to held back by the division of privately owned land into small parcels. Here, existing improvements and scientific procedures will be put into practice with a resulting leap forward which will assure to society all the products it needs. In this way, such an abundance of goods will be able to satisfy the needs of all its members. Would somebody contest that this is the same? This is not the same sentiment as the previous statement. 
dividing private property into smaller pieces and then using technology to create abundance out of scarcity. Does anybody have any idea where this comes from? Karl Marx. Close. <laughs> from Engels, the principles of communism in 1847. It's just a thing. Okay, I'm a historian of a little bit. I don't get to practice it very often. Um, but I could not help myself when I read that to think, I've heard this somewhere uh, before. I don't have a lot of time here. I know we're running late. Our paper, um, uh, 46, let me get to that now. It's really not a, it's sort of a response to the PCAST report, but not really. It's, a, it's slightly larger uh, in its coverage. Uh, most studies on government spectrum have said what we need to do is have some market mechanism. I mean, they all do. And, and you'll note in the paper, if you do bother to read it, which maybe you won't, but if you do, you'll notice there's actually, from 1991, the NDI had, had a spectrum report. I don't know if anybody remembers that. I mean, a lot of us think of this government thing as new. In 1991, the NTIA wrote this report. It's a very lengthy report. It pretty much contains everything that has been written about the issue since in it. Everything I could find subsequent had already been said by the NTIA nearly a quarter century ago. That was the result of a proceeding, which would have probably been a couple of years before that, which it probably took them five years of hollering at them to actually have the proceeding in the first place. So we're looking at something 25, 30 years old and it's in, in the process. But if you do get a chance, it's hard to find actually online. I'm going to try to get a copy of it and post it on Phoenix Center's website. It's a very, a very good report, very thorough, it contained everything in it really that we're talking about now. The PCAST report stuff is not there. It was said 25 years ago uh, by the NTIA. Uh, but I, I, I think it's said better. Uh, in fact. Um, the problem with with this idea that we'll just get the government to pay market prices and that'll solve the efficiency problem. This comes from the standard economic theory of production, the Isocline, uh, Isocost uh, model. But there's some problems. First of all, it's not true. These aren't true market prices. This is some government agency that's choosing market prices. Okay? And it's not clear that's going to work all that well. The history has shown that it doesn't work all that well in places that have tried it. Uh, the second is uh, federal agencies are not profit maximizers. There's a reason when firms face market prices, they behave in a certain way. They behave in a certain way, they cost minimize. They try to find the least cost combination of spectrum and uh, technology, capital, to produce a given level of output. It's cost minimization, which comes from profit maximization. Okay? The government is not that. The government does not profit maximize. So there's no reason to expect that the reason it behaves poorly with regard to spectrum is inefficient because it doesn't face market prices. There's more to it than that. The Department of Defense faces market prices for many things and pays $750 per hammer. Okay? So the government's inefficiency is not solely related to market prices. And the budget process matters. If you were to, for example, which I think is the most obvious outcome, and I think it think this way because of the GSA model, if the government says, the government agencies, I got $100 million of spectrum uh, that I'm using. They go to Congress and say, Cong and I've got to pay some, you know, the government spectrum agency the fee, $100 million. They go to Congress and say, I need $100 million to pay my spectrum fee. And Congress says, okay. They write them a $100 million check because it's just going to go right back out of one pocket into the other. So it's really not like it has an impact on the budget. Okay? If that happens, then nothing has to change. <laughs> I can continue to do exactly what I'm doing, use an efficient mix of spectrum and capital, produce the same output with no impact. Okay, so the budget process is going to be very significant, and the PCAST report itself notes that the budget process matters. PCAST also proposes the spectrum currency, which is a solution to no problem. Okay, and it's just, it's just a poorly uh, thought out economic idea. Because if you want the market outcome, you can't have the government trading spectrum with itself. The problem is not the opportunity cost of spectrum within the government. The problem is the opportunity cost of spectrum between the government and the commercial sector. And the spectrum currency doesn't involve the commercial sector. So the price signal is not right. Uh, the other question is the economic efficiency of management, which is the bulk of the paper. And we develop a simple model, not so simple, it's a simple model, but it looks simple. 
a general equilibrium model of spectrum allocation. We essentially allow spectrum to be held by the government to produce its goods. And they have value. We have, and then we have the government has, the private sector has some spectrum that's been allotted to the past. And then we have a block of spectrum that the government will either auction to the private sector, which the private sector will become the manager of it, or the government will manage the spectrum and lease it to the private sector. Okay, this is sort of a PCAST type model where the government leases it. Now the trick here is that the government has said it is inefficient, and I don't think anybody would contest that. Okay? So in the model you have to think, well how do you model that efficiency? The other problem is, is what is the objective function of the government? And I don't know what that is, I don't think anybody knows what that is. What are they trying to maximize? Okay, and economists sometimes say social welfare, I don't think that's true. Okay. But nevertheless, we make that assumption. Okay. But we make the assumption of welfare maximization, but we assume that the government is a relatively inefficient manager of spectrum used for the provision of private goods. Okay. So, what do you get? You get a lot of interesting results. But I think the takeaway is that if you ever see a proposal that says the government is going to lease spectrum to the private sector and manage it, then that proposal includes two little options, the spectrum and its form of exclusive licenses. By definition, it includes that, because the government is an inefficient manager of spectrum for the private sector. Okay, it's a fairly straightforward conclusion. The government should manage as little spectrum as necessary for the provision of private goods, and possibly even for the provision of public goods. Okay. Now, how do we, we want to make this simple, and I'll go through this quickly. This is essentially the fancy model we have. Entity A excels at doing activity X. Entity B stinks at doing activity X. Who should do activity X? Okay. It would be entity A. And this is slightly different than the logic of PCAST, which would have concluded that entity B should be doing it. Okay. But this is the way the model works. So it fits to say, if the government as a whole is inefficient, then it shouldn't be managing spectrum. Okay, the spectrum report from 1991 pretty much says the same thing. We believe that the public interest would be better served if spectrum management in the United States made greater use of management approach, not use, but the management of spectrum relied on so successfully throughout our economy to allocate resources and produce those goods and services most valued by consumers, the market system. They also said federal users could have a private contractor build and operate a pooled system using government spectrum to meet existing federal needs. It may even be that the private sector is the best manager of the public's spectrum. Because the private sector has the incentive to manage it efficiently, not inefficiently. Okay? If they can find it, the contractor could sell to the, sell to the public any excess capacity on the system once the federal needs are met. Well, if the private sector says, if I can meet the federal needs and sell something, they will do that. Okay. They will pursue the efficient path because it's in their nature to pursue the efficient path. It's in their nature to pursue profits. You have two issues, I think, in spectrum. This is what I've learned from this paper. And I don't, believe me, I don't have all the answers. There are many people much more informed about this than I am. There's the question of inefficient use, which gets a lot of focus. Then there's the question of inefficient use of the spectrum, and I think Tom kind of hit on that a little bit. The latter is far more important. Right? We say in the paper, and we said in the press release, just if, if the government uses copy paper inefficiently, it doesn't really affect the efficiency of the copy paper market. Because we sell copy paper to lots of businesses, it's produced in, in a competitive market, like everything still works. It's just this, these people use it inefficiently. Okay. If the government manages it inefficiently, then the whole system is messed up. Everything's messed up. That's a far bigger concern, in my opinion. And so we, my view, my takeaway from the paper was that we need to start, stop thinking about how to make the government a better manager of spectrum, and start thinking about how we use the private sector and the natural incentives of the people in the private sector to make efficient use of our spectrum resource. Thank you. I think uh, given we're running considerably over time, we'll defer questions to informally during the
the breakage is moving to the next panel. I want to thank uh, our panelists and uh, for, I think, very uh, provocative and uh, informative presentations. Thank you. Thank all of you.